Hello there, I'm Black Bright and I'm broadcasting out of the UK. Welcome to my channel. I'm just messing around with the lights here because it really does seem that depending on where you sit, the light is really, and the way I come over, differs incredibly. So I'm going to have to find a way of doing something about my environment and the lighting. Anyway, that's not your problem, that's mine. I'm Black Bright, I'm broadcasting out of the UK. Welcome to my channel. Thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you don't. Um, I decided to um, do this video because I've been receiving information or material recently which is very divisive and I don't like it. And that's why I called it The Division Has Begun because you can get a feeling of when um, people are trying to um, divide people um, and it's done in such a very, and it's not even subtle. But the first thing I got was a video from a Haitian woman. And she was talking about how Jamaicans don't like them and how they treat them. And I thought to myself, well, where is that coming from? I have never heard, especially in this day and age, any Jamaican talk badly about a Haitian. I've heard of people in the Bahamas talking bad about Haitians because when they were on their land and they wanted to boot them out. I've heard that some certain people in America, but I haven't heard of an island or a country specifically um, against Haitians, and in particular Jamaica. I, can't, I couldn't believe it, and I thought, what is this about? It's very divisive and it's come up from nowhere. It's not like something's happened. Um, somebody's, been, somebody's been fighting or not unless she's had a personal experience and it just happens, just so happens that that person is Jamaican or Jamaican background, which is where this video is coming from. But I'm going to let you listen to the video and then I'm going to um, share with you some other material that makes me feel as though the division has come. And that includes Kwasi Kwateng, Kwateng, it includes the Hussey and Fulani situation, it includes the lady, the black teacher who won 460000 because she was discriminated against, well, a white person took her post who was less qualified. And all of these little things, and of course the migrants, that's a big issue. But all of these um, situations seem to be causing divisiveness. So let me let you listen to the video. See how Jamaican is disrespecting us? But I don't see nobody stitching it and having all of this to say to Jamaican. Yeah, they may they've made fun out of that, but those are serious accusations, and it's not based on anything. If she okay, 
She's saying that Jamaicans have been disrespecting Haitians. She's not saying how they've done it or what they've done to deserve that accusation. And it was, I just thought, because it came out of nowhere, it was divisive. And sometimes you get these pawns or these people who are put out there to create division. So all I wanted to say is, number one, as far as I know, Jamaicans have got no beef against Haitians. So what did I find on a more political front? Jamaica has been at the forefront as a country, compassionate and ready to provide a helping hand, especially in times of need and times of economic and political upheaval. For years, the Haitian flag flew on its embassy in the Kingston and St Andrews metropolis, and students from the prestigious British type grammar schools, where French is taught religiously, to make the trek to Haiti as they attempt to practice the French language and explore the French Creole culture of a sister and neighbouring Caribbean country. Jamaica made provisions for Haitian refugees and a number of Haitians are living in Jamaica. So that's all I've got to say on that one. Because I don't live in Jamaica. I don't know if she's talking about Jamaicans in America. I don't know where she's got that information from. But all I'm going to say is I don't know where it's coming from, apart from the fact that I feel it's just been deliberately put there to be divisive and to cause controversy, which, of course, it's done. And when you see those um, those people kind of with their profanities and stuff, it's because they are absolutely shocked at her accusations. They don't know where it's coming from. The same way as I don't know where it's coming from. When I got that, I'm like, what? Anyway. Now we have, um, according to Migration Watch, taxpayers have to cough up nearly two billion for migrants. First of all, um, a migrant is anyone who um, leaves from one country to another to settle, whether temporarily or permanent, in another country. That shouldn't really say migrants because that points the finger at every single one of the foreigners. And that is not who the government is spending nearly two billion pounds on. The government is spending one point five billion pounds on asylum seekers. It's a still a lot of money when you think about America. It's one point eight billion and America is so much larger than brilliant. So it's still a problem. And what is that? I don't know whose fault it is. Because on the one hand, uh, Britain has signed up to accept refugees, well, to accept asylum seekers, along with all the other countries that um, have done so. And so they've had to put in, an, they're putting in an agreement and they're doing their best to stop them from coming because once they land, as long as they get on the shore, Britain has to take them. So they're trying to prevent them from not coming on the shore. But once they get on the shore, Britain has a legal obligation to accept them. Now, the reason why I said this was division is because of the wording. Number one, the migrants, which paints a picture of every foreigner or the ones, especially those who you can identify, which are people of colour, are costing the government one, two, nearly two billion, which is not true. So, um, like I said, a migrant is a person who moves away from his or her usual place of residence, whether within a country or across an international border, temporarily or permanently, for a variety of reasons. That could be people coming legally on work permits and all sorts, many of which are not costing the country anything. It is the asylum seekers who are costing the UK 1.5 billion. And although they are migrants, um, it would be better, it would be more accurate to say asylum seekers. So there's no confusion um, because it's confusion that causes division. Um, in America, it's 1.8 billion, like I said. Um, at least 44,000 
and 57 people have crossed illegally in 1,080 boats since the start of this year, up to the 2nd of December. This is approximately 1.6 times the 26,631 people reported arriving up to the end of the end of November last year. 28,526 were reported crossing during all of 2021. A population the size of a city, at least 83,191 people have been disclosed as coming uninvited by boat since 1st of January 2018. As far as I know, this information has not been verified. Um, UK taxpayers fork out about 5.6 million per day housing asylum claimants and refugees, including in four-star star resorts. That is not verified and it's misleading. And even though um, some of them have, you have some four-star hotels, they, they're allocated as four-star hotels, who make a deal with the government to house these um, asylum seekers on a very, very short-term basis until they can get through their paperwork. It's not for very long. It's not like they they are. It is costing the government money, and I'm not justifying it. But it's not like they're living in these four star hotels long term. Um, so, like I said, what is quite divisive is that what they omit to tell you is that twenty four thousand and four people entered immigration detention. Well, twenty four thousand and four asylum seekers entered immigration detention in the year ending June 2022. Let me reread that. 24,004 people entered immigration detention in the year ending June 2022. An increasing proportion of those entering detention have been small boat arrivals who have been detained in order to confirm their identity and register their asylum claim. So what I'm saying is that, okay, um, the sources migration watch. Um, yes, they're saying 44,057 people have crossed illegally in 1,080 boats, but 50% of that, or just over 50% of those people are, are in immigration detention centres. They're not roaming around the streets and using our money. But to be honest, the detention centres, they're costing the government money as well. So you, it's half a dozen of one, isn't it? Ruto's fact check states, the UK Home Office confirmed to Reuters by phone that 48,000 statistics does not refer to the number of asylum seekers in hotels at any one time, but to those housed across a range of accommodation. So their verdict, this is the Reuters verdict, is that it's false information. Approximately 1,000 asylum seekers are housed in hotels each night. That's still a lot though. The claim that there are 6,000 veterans sleeping rough each night is unsubstantiated. And that article was produced by the Reuters fact check team. And, I'm, you know, I put the links in the description. So, um, and then we also got a repeat and in our faces of Hossi and Fulani incident. That's another kind of division, black and white, which makes people feel uncomfortable. Why does it keep coming up in our faces now? Um, Ngozi Fulani, she is receiving all kinds of threats, racist threats, and goodness knows what. She's had to stop operations in her business because of because she spoke out about Lady Hussey. And the thing is, is that on the one hand, you can ask yourself, um, did I have to say something? Was it necessarily? For, was it necessarily for me to? Um, say something about Lady Hussey's approach. But sometimes things can get your goat, can't they? 
you know, somebody keeps asking you how many times, so many times, um, where are you really from? That's a kind of a pain in the butt. And because we share experiences every day, especially people of a certain ilk, everything that happens to them, they put it on Twitter or Facebook. And her initial um, tweet wasn't provocative or wasn't... Um, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't a negative tweet. It was just like, oh, you know, yesterday was fine if it wasn't for, you know, more or less somebody being a pain in the butt. But it wasn't a, an attack on Lady Susan Hussey. I think what happened is she put that out and then the media or whoever must have asked her, oh, what happened? And then she's kind of opened up about what's happened and both it's got blown out of proportion. But what I'm saying is all about these things that happen, that cause division, that we need to be careful of and question why certain things are blown out of proportion and other things are swept under the carpet. Um, what else have I got here? We've got um, the provocative headlines. Black teacher wins 460000 for racial discrimination after she was stripped of senior role and replaced with a less qualified white colleague. Now, tap, you know, tag that onto the Hussey and Fellani incident. It just creates division, doesn't it? Is it really necessary? I, you know, sometimes, you know, she gets 460 grand, good luck to her. But, you know, it's it's the way it's presented. And it's presented provocatively. So Catherine Burton York won more than 460,000 in a race discrimination act. Due Martyrs School, which is a Catholic school, head teacher put year heads in a selection process. Burton York lost her role where she worked for more than 10 years to a less experienced and qualified white staff member. A judge ruled the London teacher had suffered race discrimination and harassment. However, Mrs. Burton York, who is a black Afro-Caribbean, was the only one who failed the process and a less experienced and less qualified white staff member was later appointed to the role. Now, what I don't understand is if she failed the process, how she had a case. But obviously, there's information that's not being shared. Otherwise, she would not have won that case. But that's why I'm saying it's provocative, because, you know, you can have the truth, but you can extract certain information to make it explosive, emotive, and to give it, you know, some kind of sensationalism. But if it was written accurately, we would be able to have a good feeling about why she won that case. Because I tell you something, these courts are very, very vigilant. They're not going to award that kind of money willy-nilly. So I think there's some information that's gone amiss or we don't know what it is that would justify her winning her case. Apparently, the school later carried out calculated tactics to ruin its relationship with Mrs. Burton York, and she resigned. Now, what they term as calculated tactics, even using those words, um, it makes it look like, you know, making a mountain over a molehill. And how can you prove calculated tactics? But what it really amounts to is constructive dismissal. Sometimes when you work for um, the government um, and they know they cannot sack you easily, they can make your life hell. They can make your life really in- uncomfortable. They can interrogate every single thing you do. At first you had a certain element of freedom, the next minute you're under the microscope. And so it was probably something like that. Why? she won the case. Not only did she not get the post, she wasn't given um, an opportunity to reapply. She wasn't given any feedback as to why she didn't 
get the post. And on top of that, after um, afterwards, they, well, I think not all the whole school, I think it was one person in particular, um, made it quite difficult for her to work there. She ended up having mental issues and ended up going off sick and in the end, you know, resigned. But felt forced to resign because of the work environment. So now she has won a staggering, these are the words, the emotive words of the Daily Mail. 462,973 after successfully suing Duane Martis for race discrimination harassment, as well as unfair dismissal at an employment tribunal. Background covering, background according to the Daily Mail. In March 2017, quite a long time ago, five years, um, Mrs. Burton York was told she had failed and would not be appointed as head of the year, even though two posts remained available. A tribunal report said she was not given any written feedback about what had led to her being unsuccessful. She was not given the opportunity to work on whatever areas of weakness had been perceived and to reapply again for the two remaining vacant heads of the year posts. She was not told she could appeal. Two less experienced and less qualified white staff members were appointed as heads of years. Now, I've extracted information. I haven't kind of said it verbatim as how it was published, but I just took out the key things because so as not to overload you. Um, I'm putting in the link, so if you want to see the full um, publication, you can. She said, regrettably, I am of the view I have been treated less favourably to my comparators because of my protected characteristic and I have been discriminated through a series of adverse continuing acts, intentionally or not, throughout my employment at the Douay's Martyrs Catholic Secondary School. I also believe I have been victimised and bullied. This has had far-reaching impact on my mental and physical health. I was wondering, you know, sometimes you can be in an organisation for quite a long time and then you get a new staff member who comes in and just gums for you. Believe me, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. It is not very nice. And as I say, it, just, it was just me and God because, you know, when they're ready to get you, boy, you had better have somebody... Um, who's got your back. The tribunal heard that during the selection process, answers were weighted differently for different applicants. There was a lack of notes for meetings and discussions were ha weren't had about what would constitute a pass or fail. Because normally you have a, a tick box and what you're supposed to do is tick. You ask your questions and you tick on each um, recruitment selection process. Um, how well the applicant answered those questions. So you've got something to refer back to so that when situations like this come up, you are able to prove that there was no discrimination and that you had specific points why a person was selected. So it looks like they didn't kind of have something similar. Employment judge Patrick Quill ruled that her claims against Diocese of Westminster Academy Trust, which runs a school, succeeded. Judge Quill said, the school has not persuaded us that the decision was not related to race and has not persuaded us that it was in no sense whatsoever because of race. The tribunal in Watford heard Mrs. Burton York, a geography teacher who joined Wes Martin in two 2004 and was regarded as excellent and outstanding by her fellow teachers. So there'll be a lot of, that's why I said it's divisive because there's going to be a lot of people, she'll probably have people on her back, who knows, I hope she doesn't, but um, yeah, a lot of people making a big noise about how much money she's got and you know, another black woman with a chip on her shoulder making a big deal out of nothing, you know, so she didn't get the job, she failed, why is she making a fuss? But she who feels it, knows it. Sometimes you cannot put a finger on it, you cannot articulate a feeling. And I remember watching a video 
um, a police video and you know I view them sometimes to see how the police interact with um, their suspects and the way the police officer um, was interacting with the person the suspect he was following all the rules but his tone was really patronizing and condescending and it was something that you could say okay he's following all the rules so he should get a green but there's something surreptitious about the interaction that makes as a black person and that person happened to be asian he wasn't black but as a black or brown person you would pick it up so you had a few white people on the panel who said, no, no, he was doing his job. He was, you know, he wasn't, um, he, he did his go wisely and whatever. Followed, you know, followed the role to the T, what he was supposed to do. And so when I spoke out, I felt, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to be classed as one of those people who've got a chip on their shoulder, seeing something that isn't really there. But. Thank goodness there was a white senior police officer who actually picked up on what I said. And he said, yes, I know what Myrna is saying. I heard it. I felt it. I saw it. And it was such a relief because sometimes you feel as though you're imagining things and it's not something you can explain. So all I'm saying is that, you know, what might seem like a mountain made out of a molehill is sometimes a genuine sense of something is not quite right. So that is the end of this video. I hope you found it interesting. And as usual, I'd appreciate your comments. And that's all for now.